Here's a list of the topics we're going to cover today, including important tenets of the match participation agreement for school officials, some functionality in the web-based registration ranking and results system that school officials can or must access uh, throughout the main match season, and where to find some helpful resources on the NRMP public website. Before we jump into the important policy considerations for SOs, I would like to provide just a little bit of information about the NRMP for those of you who might be relatively new to our match community. The Maine Residency Match is the largest of the NRMP's matching programs. Um, it opens in September and it culminates with Match Week, which is the third week in March. For the 2019 match, we had 44, a little over 44,000 registrants, 38,000 of which submitted uh, rank ordered lists of program choices. We had 5,600 programs that placed over 35,000 positions in the match. So it was our biggest match. We seem to say that every year because every year we seem to grow in some capacity, either the number of positions or the number of applicants. So we are growing. Programs must be ACGME accredited to participate in the main residency match. And we do represent all specialties except ophthalmology and urology because they have their own national matching plans. There are several types of positions that are offered through the main residency match, so I thought I would just very quickly uh, review those. The categorical or C positions are PGY1 positions in programs that provide the full course of training that is required for board certification in the specialties. Categorical primary care positions, specifically in medicine and pediatrics, we designate with an M in the match. One year preliminary or P positions are in transitional or specialty programs. And the advanced or A positions are in specialty programs that begin the year after the main residency match, so at the PGY2 level. And they are subsequent to one or more years of preliminary training. Applicants in the main match that are interested in advanced specialties usually will also apply to and rank preliminary positions in order to secure the full course of training at the same time. The main match certainly allows for that. Physician or R positions are in specialty programs that begin the year of the main match. So there's July 1 after the, the match week in March, but are for physicians with prior graduate medical education. So our positions are not available for current seniors because you have to have had some prior GME in order to qualify. In addition to the main residency match, the NRP sponsors multiple fellowship matches under its specialties matching service. And to date, we have 22 matches that represent 67 fellowship subspecialties. Uh, for the 2019 appointment year, we had 12,000 applicants that were vying for 11,000 positions. We have slightly more flexible participation requirements at the fellowship level. Programs must be accredited by the ACGME or another acceptable entity. They can be affiliated with an ACGME accredited program in the core discipline, or they can lead to certification and have oversight from an ABMS board. So there's a little flexibility with respect to fellowship matches. Looking internally at the NRMP, we have a 19 member board of directors that includes medical school deans, medical school student affairs deans, GME program directors, and we always have one public member. Those individuals uh, who sit on the board are elected uh, for a four-year term of service and they can renew that once. So up to two four-year terms of service for these directors. We also have three resident physician or fellow directors and three medical student directors who just by the nature of their training or their, their education, they serve one two-year term of service. If you think you might be interested in serving on the NRMP board, I certainly welcome you and encourage you uh, to check our website, usually sometime in mid-October uh, to early November for our announcement. We have open positions almost every year and we start that process in the fall. So if you're interested, certainly be on the lookout this fall. Lastly, this is a snapshot of the NRMP organization. We currently have 19 employees that work on finance, match operations, IT, policy, research, and communications. So that's just a little, little snapshot of what it's like here at our offices in Washington, DC. Okay, now that you know a bit more about the NRMP, why don't we move to a discussion of important policy considerations for osteopathic school officials. As most of you likely know, 
The match participation agreement outlines the policies and procedures and the rights and responsibilities of all participants in the matching program. Tenants of the match participation agreement that I think are of particular interest for medical school officials include sponsored applicants, what that means and what that involves for school officials, general insight and guidance on communications throughout the application, interview, and matching process, and certainly SOAP, all things related to SOAP, eligibility, verification, communications. So let's explore some policies on each of these topics. In light of the single accreditation system, the NRMP Board of Directors voted this past May to make osteopathic senior students sponsored applicants in the main residency match. So for the next few slides, I wanna provide some information about that status and what that means for applicants and for you as school officials or representatives of osteopathic medical schools. So who is a sponsored applicant? A sponsored applicant is an applicant who is a student enrolled in a medical school accredited by the LCME or the Commission on Osteopathic College Accreditation at the time of registration for the match. How is sponsored applicant eligibility for the match determined? You know, contrary to what may be a popular notion, uh, eligibility to participate in the main match and to enter GME on July 1 is actually based largely on graduation requirements of the medical school. Certainly the NRMP requires at, at, at its foundation eligibility for GME on July 1, but grad, the medical schools may have additional graduation requirements um, that they use to consider those seniors that are eligible for match participation. So that's one reason why your role as the school official is so important to ensure that all the students who should be in the match are registered and to determine their eligibility based on what you know about the unique requirements of your particular school. So what positions can a sponsored applicant be offered? If any of an institution's graduate medical education programs participates in the main match, then all of the institution's programs, regardless of the program's match participation status, must offer positions to sponsored applicants through the match or through another national matching plan. Now that is the plain language from section 5.1 of the match participation agreement for schools. But if we can sort of look at it a different way, can a sponsored applicant be offered a position outside of the match? Withdrawing a sponsored applicant to accept a position outside the main match or even for a preliminary position for a program that participates in another national matching plan, like let's say ophthalmology, that violates the match agreement. So this means that osteopathic seniors now must be offered and accept positions for match participating programs through the main match or another national matching plan. And that might be a slight change from prior years. So what is the school official's role with respect to sponsored applicants? School officials are expected to immediately revoke the school's sponsorship and withdraw prior to the rank order list certification deadline any sponsored applicant who is ineligible to enter GME on July 1 of the year of the match. This would mean that the applicant's rank order list would not be used when we process the matching algorithm, and the applicant would not be eligible to participate in SOAP during match week unless the applicant becomes eligible for graduate medical education by Wednesday prior to match week. And we're gonna to touch a little bit on that uh, a little bit later in this webinar. Can a sponsored applicant withdraw from the main match? A sponsored applicant may withdraw from the main match only through the applicant's medical school official and only for predetermined reasons. So this is new for osteopathic uh, applicants or senior students and school officials this year. You will now have the responsibility of withdrawing senior students from the match. When osteopathic students and graduates were considered independent applicants under the match policy, they could log into the NRMP's registration ranking results system at any time prior to the rank order list deadline and withdraw themselves. That no longer will be the case for osteopathic seniors. As school officials, you will assume that role and responsibility. So what options would exist for withdrawn sponsored applicants if that's in fact steps you will have to take this next year? Withdrawn sponsored applicants can submit applications to non-match participating programs no earlier than three o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Monday of match week, which is one of, I guess, sort of the official launch of the SOAP uh, experience. Uh, withdrawn sponsored applicants can accept a position outside of the match no earlier than 12 o'clock 
Eastern time on Wednesday of match week. If the training will begin after July 1 and before February 1 in the year following the match. If withdrawn sponsored applicants elect to participate in the match the following year, we would consider them sponsored applicants. And so again, all of these eligibility and withdrawal status criteria would apply. What about senior students with military appointments? School officials must withdraw by the rank order list certification deadline those students who receive positions in US military GME programs. However, students are required to inform school officials of their military match status. This is actually a change from what has been a, sort of a longstanding practice with the NRMP. For the 2019 main residency match, the NRMP board of directors elected to um, update or revise the policy to require uh, students, senior students, to notify their school officials of their appointments through the military match so that their school officials could officially withdraw them from the main residency match. We had for many, many years worked directly with the military branch GME offices to identify those applicants that had been placed in civilian programs and to ensure that they were withdrawn from the main residency match before we processed the algorithm. But over the last few years, the data that we had received from the various military branches was spotty, it was inconsistent, and there was increased concern on the part of the NRMP that there might be some liability if the data that we received from the military branches wasn't as clear and as comprehensive as we needed it to be in order to make a determination about a student's eligibility for participation. So we changed the match participation agreement last year to require students to take on that responsibility and communicate in a timely manner with their school officials. So it is your responsibility to withdraw those students if they accept or are placed into positions through the military match, but it is something that they are obligated under the match participation agreement to notify you of. And that is certainly an education piece that we work on with applicants throughout the fall. So to recap, beginning with the 2020 main residency match, Osteopathic senior students will be designated as sponsored applicants, and that means that they must accept positions through the NRMP or another national matching plan. They cannot withdraw themselves, nor can they be withdrawn for non-match positions, and school officials must assume responsibility for withdrawing students by the rank order list deadline and only for pre-approved reasons. So we will touch a little bit more on, on where to find that information and to sort of have some guidance and some resources on how that process works. We will touch on a little bit later in this webinar. What other policies might be important for school officials to know? And some of this is just review, but I thought it might be good to touch on. The NRMP board routinely reviews our policies regarding communication. So I wanted just to highlight a few obligations for school officials. According to the match agreement, the school must provide complete, timely, accurate, and up-to-date information to the NRMP about the school and its students and graduates. Um, so according to the match agreement, school must provide um, information that's complete, timely, and accurate, especially with respect to the medical school performance evaluation or the dean's letter. We, the NRMP board has worked um, over the last couple of years sort of in in conjoined effort with um, the MSPE um, revision task uh, force that had been sort of put together with, within the undergraduate and graduate medical education community, um, wanting the school officials to be able to provide real-time information as it's available um, with respect to information about eligibility of uh, current students, um, compatibility of former graduates. So that's even for those for whom an MSPE already has been written. Um, if schools are aware of information that really is pertinent to a program's ability to effectively determine um, a candidate's um, eligibility or goodness of fit for the residency program, we want the schools to be able to provide that information to the programs. And that may mean um, an addendum to an MSPE that's already been submitted or just updates to uh, an MSPE that may be currently under development so that um, programs have the best and most accurate information uh, when considering an applicant's candidacy. So again, you can find um, more uh, specific language at section 6.8 of the uh, match participation agreement for schools, but really wanting to make sure that the Dean's letter provides um, good information to programs. 
The board also clarified the language about the confidentiality of rank order lists. This is not terribly new, um, but it was clarified within uh, the last year or so. As a reminder for how this works, an applicant rank order list is confidential. Applicants have the right to keep the rank order lists confidential and not to share them with any individual or entity. So that means school officials cannot ask or require or otherwise pressure an applicant to disclose a rank order list. School officials can, absolutely can, offer to review a rank order list to support their students in the matching process, and students can always choose voluntarily to share their rank order lists with medical school advisors. So we're not looking to limit or restrain the communication between school advisors and their students, particularly when they are going through what could be an arduous task of putting a rank order list together. But we want to make sure that, that students don't feel like they're obligated or required or coerced to do that uh, by anybody at the school or anybody at the program as well. We have very clear language within the match participation agreement about programs asking ranking intentions or preferences. So the confidentiality of ranking is certainly a cornerstone of the match process and we do appreciate the efforts of programs, institutions, and schools to sort of respect that privacy and allow applicants sort of that freedom. Before leaving match policy, I'd like to touch base on SO or school official requirements for SOAP, namely the communications and the verification process. It's important to the integrity of SOAP, I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but for, for all involved to understand and to message and to ensure compliance with the communication rules. The, the dark bold language I have here is straight from section 7.3.1 of the MPA for schools. SOAP eligible unmatched applicants are only allowed to initiate contact with the directors of unfilled programs through ARIS and they cannot reach out or initiate contact in any other way until the directors of those programs initiate contact with them. In essence, the same rule applies for any individuals or entities that are acting on behalf of an unmatched applicant. They are not allowed to initiate contact until the directors of unfilled programs initiate contact, and that's regardless of the initiator's role at an institution or school. After three o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Monday, which again is when programs are able to access through ARIS and download the um, applications that have been sent by unmatched applicants. Once that process is underway and they've received an ARIS application, unfilled programs can initiate contact with an applicant, they can initiate contact with the school, they can initiate contact with, with anybody who is advocating on behalf of that applicant. But it is very clear in the match participation agreement that the programs are the ones who need to initiate that communication. Let's return just briefly to section 2.2.5 of the match agreement for schools so we can look a little bit more closely at the school official requirements for SOAP verification. Again, the plain language in the match agreement says, or reads, that if a medical school revokes its sponsorship of and withdraws from the match a sponsored senior student because the student is ineligible to enter GME on July 1, then the student's rank order list shall not be used when the matching algorithm is processed and the student will not be eligible to participate in SOAP unless by five o'clock p.m. Eastern time on the Wednesday prior to match week, the student becomes eligible to enter GME on July 1. So school officials are required to access the NRMP's web-based registration ranking and results system between Monday and Wednesday prior to match week to verify the eligibility of all students and prior graduates to participate in SOAP should those students learn on Monday of match week that they are unmatched. Those that are not verified automatically will be ineligible for SOAP. And so now as we turn to more of a discussion of school official responsibilities within the R3 system, we can examine this process a bit more uh, in depthly because I know that this is an area of concern for a lot of the schools out there. So in this next section, we will explore some, some basic functionality within the R3 system that is specific to the school official role. Some of this will be new, but I think most of it will be a review for those of you who've been with the NRMP for at least a few years um, and just features that are designed to assist school officials in managing the match cycle. So some is new, but some is also just um, a review. Under the terms of the match agreement, the SO, or the school official, school administrators, are responsible for overseeing the match process and to serve as the official spokesperson to the NRMP. 
So to ensure sponsored applicants complete the registration process and that they execute the match participation agreement and they pay their fees, the school officials and administrators can upload into the R3 system a list of the school's sponsored applicants. They manage the student and graduate participation in the match and they verify eligibility of sponsored applicants to enter GME, both at the algorithm phase and for SOAP, and to verify the graduation of their prior graduates. So these are the functionalities that we're gonna look at um, within the R3 system and give a little bit of context for each. Now that osteopathic senior students are sponsored applicants, osteopathic medical school officials will have the ability to upload a senior student list into the R3 system that can help them oversee the applicant registration process. So what SOs are able to do is to create what we call a tab delimited text file on their computer. They can upload it, and once that upload is complete in the R3 system, the school officials are able to see who still needs to register for the match, they can edit a student's participation status, they can even add students to the list. This functionality in the R3 system, I think, is a great resource for school officials. It is not required. School officials do not have to upload the list. But if they do, the R3 system compares the applicants or the students who are registered um, to the uploaded list, and it removes applicants as they complete that registration process. So it becomes a great resource for school officials to be able to track their students and to be able to give a gentle nudge to those students um, who still need to complete the registration process. If by the end of the registration process, which would be the same date as the rank order list certification deadline, hopefully this list would be zeroed out. What I've included here, and hopefully will be active when we post the PowerPoint presentation to um, our public website, is a link to a support guide that we have uh, on the NRP website that would provide step-by-step -step instructions for how to complete this task. If you're interested in how it would look, I provided a few um, screenshots here of the R3 system. Again, after creating the tab delimited file, the student can, uh, the, the school official, my apologies, can log into the system and click on the upload student list link, which you can see right here in the red triangle. If the upload is successful, then it will say in the top left corner um, that the upload was successful and you can see that with the red triangle. All students uploaded into the R3 system are by default considered participating because you put this list together for the upload. But participation status can be changed by the school official and you can see that with the red arrow in that right column. School officials can also make edits um, to the student's information by clicking the view and the edit list link at the bottom of the screen. Again, the system keeps track of, the, of the, those students that have registered and will keep the list current by removing those applicants. And again, you sort of wanna be able to see this list zero out by the time the registration process has concluded. SOs or school officials are also responsible for managing students and graduates throughout the match cycle. And by accessing the students and graduates page, the school official can monitor applicants, both current students and graduates who have registered for the match. So you can see sort of who's completed the process. You can withdraw and reinstate sponsored applicants. And again, that will going forward include allopathic and osteopathic seniors and be able to edit and update application graduation, applicant graduation dates should those change over the course of the uh, MS4 year. Again, here is the link to the support guide that would provide step-by-step -step instructions, and I will show you here in just a few minutes where to find that exactly on our website. Here are a couple of screenshots that would show you how to find this directly within the R3 system. After you log in, you could go to school at the top of the screen, you can see with the red arrow here, and click on students and graduates. The page that you see, and I, I didn't include that, that, the content here just because I think it would have been a little bit dense, but when you, when you click on students and graduates, you're taken to a page that will show you in plain language um, how many students are in active status for the match and how many are in initial status. So active status for NRMP means those applicants who have registered, they've signed the match participation agreement, they've paid their registration fee, they're good to go. Applicants who are in initial status may have started the registration process but have not yet completed it. So that data would be available to you. And then further down that list, you will see two in the subsequent table, the two columns on the right 
that provide access to school officials and administrators to withdraw students or reinstate them and to edit and confirm graduation dates. Again, you can withdraw, you can reinstate, you can modify the graduation date. Again, as this information becomes available to you over the course of the year, certainly things change, students may need to take a leave of absence. This is a great place for you to be able to track that. And the information holds and is there available throughout the match season. Data must, must be verified by the rank order list certification deadline. Because again, that is the last date on which um, applicants can register and complete the registration process for the match. For verification, school officials actually have to complete two steps. One is for match participation and the other is for SOAP participation. So remember, only students and graduates who are eligible to enter GME on July 1 in the year of the match can participate in the match. Okay? Graduation credentials for match participation, so to be able to have the rank order list included and processed when we, when we run the um, matching algorithm, must be completed prior to or on the rank order list certification deadline. SOAP verification is actually completed the week prior to match week. Only applicants for whom it is determined conclusively that they are ineligible for GME should be prohibited from participating in SOAP. So let's talk a little bit more about that because we certainly see on, on this end that schools are a little anxious and sometimes maybe get confused about how to determine eligibility for SOAP. We will see that school officials sometimes mark ineligible for SOAP those students who they know have yet to meet graduation requirements. But what we do, and one of the reasons we add this, added this language in red about determining conclusively, what we want you to do is to only mark as SOAP and eligible students that you know conclusively their graduation requirements will not be met on time. So a good example that we hear from with school officials are outstanding test scores. Maybe you have senior students who don't have test scores back yet. Or maybe you have students who took the test, failed um, a step of it or, or, or a part of it, and are waiting to sign up to retake the exam. We would want you to leave in the match those students, if there is a chance that their scores will be reported prior to graduation, that they could retake the exam and get their score results back prior to graduation. Only remove or mark as SOAP eligible those you know have no chance of being able to meet the core requirements and to be able to enter GME on July 1. Those are the ones we would want you to mark as ineligible for SOAP. So again, there could be some fluid fluidity with respect to your senior students and where they are sort of marching forward to be able to complete the graduation requirements uh, in time to um, start training uh, July 1. We would rather you be um, more conservative and only withdraw those that you know for sure won't be able to meet requirements and to let participate in so those for whom you have no reason to believe, even though all of their ducks may not yet be in a row, but those for whom you have no reason to believe would not be able to finish up and complete the requirements in time. Please also keep in mind that as part of the verification for SOAP, school officials can change the eligibility of students who might have been withdrawn prior to the rank order list deadline if their status has changed. So sometimes we do have situations where schools marked ineligible for match participation a student. So they, they notified the NRMP through the R3 system prior to the rank order list deadline that they had um, a student who wasn't going to be able to graduate. Perhaps something changed after the rank order list deadline and this applicant or the student is now back on track. A student previously withdrawn or made ineligible for the match could be marked as eligible for SOAP if that status has changed. Understandably, the opposite would be true as well. Applicants for whom uh, they were certified as eligible by the rank order list deadline, something may have happened and now they have the delay and they would be marked ineligible for SOAP. So we understand there is some fluidity here. If you have questions or concerns, you can always email the NRMP. But again, just try to keep in mind that we're really looking for you to identify students you know are not gonna be eligible for July 1 and make sure that they are marked ineligible for SOAP. Again, at the bottom of the screen is a link to the URL that would provide step-by-step -step instructions for how to do this. If you have some concerns or feel a little anxious about this process, by all means, give this a, a, a look-see before um, we get well into um, early next year and everything starts to ramp up for Match Week. So again, I've got some screenshots. After you log into the system, you can select students and graduates again from the school link that you can see with the red arrow 
or you can click on review applicants, which is sort of with the red triangle, and that will take you to the same page. And for match participation, so prior to the rank order list deadline, when you um, access the, um, the um, students and graduates page, you're gonna see a column to the right that the school officials must mark as grad verified. Again, this is what you would wanna complete prior to the rank order list certification deadline. Verifying that the, the, the students and graduates on your list are eligible to enter GME on July 1. Those whose graduation credentials are not verified will automatically be marked as no and not allowed to participate in the match when we process the algorithm. So do, do make every effort to get in there and verify all of your students and graduates prior to the raw deadline. For Monday prior to match week, school officials log back into the system and now you see that we've added a SOAP eligible column all the way to the right. Again, this is where you would go to mark your students as, as yes or no for SOAP participation should they learn on Monday of match week that they are unmatched. And the same rule applies. Applicants for whom the verification is not set, we automatically mark as no. So again, you're gonna to wanna to get in there for both match participation and for SOAP verification and make sure that you've marked every um, student and graduate appropriately. So I have a couple of slides here because I wanna make sure you know what's available to you as, as a school official or administrator, what, what system reports the NRMP will create for you um, over the course of the match cycle. So you can see from this slide, we have uh, reports that cover a variety of topics and um, we identify when those reports become available over the course of the match season. Um, I wanna take a look at some available uh, reports that are at specific times within the match cycle. So the R3 system makes about a dozen reports available for what we would call sort of the matching process phase of the uh, match cycle. I would say of particular note here is the characteristics of matched seniors report that's listed at the very top. This report benchmarks each of the school's graduating class against national norms. We provide this report to the schools that support our efforts to collect accurate applicant um, USMLE and COMLEX data strictly for the purposes of publishing research like charting outcomes in the match. We don't do anything with the scores other than to make sure we can create an, applicant, uh, an accurate profile of applicants who match to their preferred specialty, which is really the thrust of charting outcomes in the match. Um, also of note, I think, is the institution and program violations report that's listed at the very bottom. This report identifies institutions and programs that have confirmed violations of the match agreement, what the nature of the violation was, and what sanctions were levied, if any. This is a report that is available only to school officials and school administrators and applicants. So it's not a report that institutions and programs can access. Strictly there to inform and guide schools and applicants. Match week reports include the SOAP schools report, um, which details in real time the status of your students at your school who have pending or have accepted SOAP offers. We also provide the match results for seniors and graduates and the advanced data tables. Um, and we give those to the school officials or we provide access to the school officials and the administrators prior to the official release of match results, um, which come out at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time on Friday of match week. So we just, we provide them. We know it's helpful information. Certainly uh, these reports can be um, extremely helpful in preparing for match day ceremonies. We just like to remind the community that they are confidential and some of these reports are uniformly embargoed until we officially release the match results on um, Friday, one o'clock on Friday. So I'm actually gonna stop there for just a moment and I'm gonna see if I can hopefully successfully move into the screen um, a copy or version of our website. And I'm hopeful that I will be able to show you some places where you might want to go if you're not very familiar with our website, um, some places that might uh, be helpful for you to better understand and sort of navigate your roles and responsibilities and certainly the roles and responsibilities of your students and your graduates over the course of the match cycle. So if you haven't been to the NRMP website, here it is. Um, I would say start at the top on the SuperNav with residency. You will see we have tabs for each of our main participant groups. If you hover over those participant groups, you will see that we have a wealth of information um, that outlines sort of do zones and ins and outs of the match. For medical schools, you will see 
that we have separate pages for some of the very topics that we've talked about today. The up, I'm sorry, a little sensitive there. Uploading and tracking students in R3, verifying graduation credentials, verifying SOAP eligibility. So I know I've touched very briefly and somewhat quickly on these topics today, but these pages will provide you with some excellent information when you're ready to sort of take a deep breath and maybe move a little slower through how these processes work. I will say we have a checklist um, that we've just updated. We're in the process of, of finalizing these updates that really lays out sort of a step-by-step -step, um, what you're gonna wanna make sure you do for each phase of the, um, the match cycle. So we have it broken down by registration, we have it broken down by ranking, and we have it broken down by results. So again, this might be something that's helpful to print and actually physically put your check marks on as you move through the match cycle, it sort of provides a bit of a timeline. But I really wanna make sure that you're aware of a page all the way down at the bottom under medical schools called support. If you click on support, you will see that we have listed, we have created some match topic videos and what we call our R3 support guides that really do break down into very fine detail all of the various or discrete components of the match cycle that school officials would need some assistance or have some questions about. So again, these are the URLs that I provided on the PowerPoint. If you come to uh, schools and support, you, will, you can access any of these and they provide screenshots and literally step-by-step -step instructions on how to add and maintain school administrators, manage your students and, and graduates, use the program directory if you need to help your applicants figure out how to list a program on a roll. Our match topic videos are purposely designed to be fairly short. We try to keep them to about five or six minutes. Again, that's probably gonna be uh, more helpful um, to be able to sort of chunk the information and give you something that's very uh, focused and very specific on a topic. But if you've got some questions about how this process works, I strongly encourage you to start here. If you do not see on the support page answers to your questions, then by all means, you can reach out to the NRMP at any time. Um, if it's not built, we'll build it for you. Um, but maybe we'll be able to help you find where on the website that information would be. So again, residency, medical schools, and then all the way down to support. Briefly, I wanna show you too our data and reports. If you click on residency for data and reports, that's where you will be able to find the most current versions of our results and data book and all of the various sort of compendium reports that go with the results and data. The most current versions of charting outcomes in the match, that is a publication we do every other year. So we will be due to update charting outcomes after the 2020 match. And then our survey reports. We, every other year, either survey program directors or applicants to get their perspectives on how they uh, put together interview strategies and ranking preferences. But if you are interested in old versions of the results and data, we have those available as well. Under data and reports, simply click on report archives and you will see we have all of the results and data, charting outcomes, I don't wanna to scroll too fast, charting outcomes in the match, the surveys are down at the bottom, and they go back for pretty much as long as we've been able to have um, a web-based interface. You can see with results and data, it goes back to 1984, even though we actually became fully web operational uh, in early 2000s. So um, there you have it for results and data. All of it's free. You can download it at any time. We do try to keep this current. As soon as reports are ready and ready to be published, we get them up on the website. And the last area I'm going to show you is the policies. If you are interested in current copies of our match participation agreements and resources, you can go to policies. It's the first link. This provides we keep current copies of the match agreements for institutions, for medical schools, for applicants, our specialties. Um, our waiver policy, violations policies are here as well. I didn't wanna take time today to get into too much of the, 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 the waiver and violations um, processes. If you have questions, I'm happy to talk with you about those at any time, but really just wanted to focus more on sort of the core requirements for school officials. I would like one final note to pull your attention to the resources at the bottom of this page. You will see an entry for medical schools. If you go to the match agreements page and you click on medical schools under resources, you will see here that we've provided the code of conduct, some policy highlights that are very specific to schools. We update that every year. And we have what we call waiver case summaries and violation case summaries, which provide some illustrative vignettes 
on the types of cases that come before the NRMP and how those cases might be adjudicated. Again, it's not comprehensive or exhaustive, but it does give schools and applicants and programs sort of a flavor of what the NRMP is looking at when we're, when we're investigating waivers or investigations and how those cases might move forward. So again, that information is there for you, should you like it. Um, and um, just provides a little more insight into um, the policy process, uh, the policies and procedures process for binding commitments. Okay, so that's what we have for our website. I'm gonna close this back out. And just a couple of slides in closing. I wanna make sure everybody is aware that we have our transition to residency conference that is coming up this fall, um, October. We have some fantastic uh, speakers that are lined up for this year's conference, including Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, Dr. Helen Fisher, and Dr. Lawrence Smith. Um, Dr. Emanuel is the chair of the Department of uh, Medical Ethics at the University of Pennsylvania. He also served as a health policy advisor to the uh, Office of Management and Budget, and he contributed to the development of the Affordable Care Act. So he's gonna come and talk, share his thoughts on sort of the challenges that are facing the healthcare system today and how to make sure that, that care is good while trying to keep costs low and make sure that, that there is care that's accessible to everybody. So I think you'll have some interesting perspectives. We also have Dr. Helen Fisher. She is the Chief Scientific Officer at Match.com. You may chuckle to, to know that we not infrequently get calls for Match.com, even though we are the match and we are not in the business of matchmaking in that way. Um, but the Chief Scientific Advisor is gonna come and talk with us about her Fisher Temperament Inventory. Um, it's designed to help people understand sort of their biological styles of thinking and behaving so they have a better understanding of themselves and how they can contribute more effectively to teams and build innovation. And Dr. Fisher has agreed to stay on and facilitate a breakout session or two so that attendees to the conference can sign up and take her temperament inventory and then sort of talk as a group about what those results and findings look like. So I'm hoping that people find that of interest. And then our uh, conference will close with Dr. Lawrence Smith, who is the dean of the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And he's gonna address the importance of teaching medical students how to provide compassionate care across the lifespan. I think a nice way to sort of end and, and remind us of just the incredible value that, that physicians bring to our world in dealing not only with patients, but their loved ones as well. The deadline for our breakout session proposal submission is actually just a couple of weeks. It's June 28th. So if you're interested, you think you might wanna to come to the conference, you might wanna present on something, please access our conference website, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, and submit your idea. These are just a few of our key themes. You know, the transition from UME to GME, how to prep residents, how to select residents, and how to determine that our students can be successful when they make it to the residency phase of their training. And then to close, new this year, we have a pre-conference workshop for program directors and coordinators and other GME office staff. If you're new to your role, or if you just would like to know more, take a deeper dive into how the NRMP uh, process works, then you can come and join our workshop. We're gonna go over the matching algorithm. We'll have everybody run their own match. We'll look a little bit more at the R3 system and discover, you know, get a little more facile of how to, to, to do every stage or every phase of the, uh, the match process. We will certainly review policies. We'll learn more about common violations and how to avoid them either for schools or for institutions and programs. And then certainly how to prepare for match week, address uh, concerns, questions, challenges that come with match week and SOAP. We wanna be able uh, to get into that nitty gritty as well. Here's a little bit of information on our conference fees. Um, you certainly can just attend the workshop or you can combine it with the main conference. And again, those dates, if you can see in the, the icon in the lower right screen, it's gonna be October 3rd through 5th. We will be in Chicago on the Magnificent Mile and we absolutely would love to see you. So this is the last of the slides um, that I have. I'm gonna try and look up here now and see if anybody has been able to post a few questions. I see that I've got a couple here. Let me see what I can do. Give me one moment. I see one question here. <clears throat> do medical school performance evaluations need addendums for all new fourth year content for fellowship applications? I'm not sure if, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking if school officials would need to modify an existing um, performance evaluation for an applicant who is moving from residency into fellowship. Um, if that 
if I'm interpreting your question correctly, then we, you would only need to do that if there is information that you have learned about this particular applicant over the course of their residency that would really, that you believe would really be valuable or pertinent to that fellowship program director's understanding of that resident's um, goodness of fit. So, you know, we would certainly expect the fellowship program um, to reach out to the core program director for some sort of verification that the applicant had completed the residency, that that applicant was in good standing, and things of that nature. So we wouldn't expect the school officials to have to step in in that respect. But if there have been other things, issues of professionalism um, or concerns that the residency has notified you as a school official of over the course of that, uh, that applicant's residency training, that might be something that would qualify for an addendum to the, to the MSPE. And it's hard to give specifics because there probably could be so many different um, um, interpretations or situations that would arise. I would certainly tell you, be mindful of the things that you uh, learn and know about your residents or your students once they leave and enter residency. And if you find you're just really uncertain, just give the NRMP a call, drop us an email, and we'll see if we can help you out. But again, Basic performance information during residency is not something I think the school official would be expected to um, amend an MSPE, but anything outside of that, something more contextual or certainly related to professionalism, that might be um, an option or, or an obligation on the part of the school official. Another question, why are we required to verify U.S. grads? Um, I'm not sure we know their status after they have graduated. And that's true. A bit, part of the NRMP's concern here is just to make sure that we are not placing candidates who are ineligible for some reason into a training position and a binding commitment. In all likelihood, your verification of U.S. grads would be something that's fairly pro forma. They've graduated. You have no reason to suspect that they're no longer eligible for GME. But because you are the, the, the spokesperson for the school, again, that slide that I said, you know, school officials are tasked with overseeing the match process for the school, and those graduates still belong to you in that sense. I think you're absolutely right. There's not going to be a whole lot that would change with respect to their eligibility status. But because you represent the school for the NRMP, um, it is something that we want you to go back and verify. Another question. When uploading data in the R3 system, fields appear to have AAMC ID and USMLE ID. Is there an option to up upload Comlex IDs for those that, that do not take the USMLE exam? Absolutely. I'm sorry if my slides were not clear with that. When applicants register for the match, we do ask them uh, to provide what we call sort of uh, personal or professional profile information. That certainly would include a AAMC ID or a Comlex ID. Um, applicants, I should let you know too, just for reassurance, um, applicants have the option of providing um, USML ID and scores and all of that information for the purposes of match registration, but they don't have to allow the NRP to use it for research purposes. They do have an opt-out. It is a consent. Um, so we do track uh, IDs, uh, USMLE and Comlex for the purposes of registration, but actual scores, if they provide it and allow us to use it, we're grateful, um, but it is not a requirement. So hopefully um, that answered uh, the question. Let me see if I've got some other here. If we have a student who has not passed their boards by the rank order list deadline, but will be taking it before match week, do we leave them as match eligible or withdraw them? I would say at this point, you would, if, if requirement for boards, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase. If passing the boards is a requirement for graduation, then yes, you would want to leave them in the match because they still may be on track to complete that requirement and then graduate and thus be eligible for GME on July 1. We would only want you to withdraw those that you know definitively will not meet graduation requirements, will not be eligible for GME. So I would assume it's possible for your students not to have, have completed all those necessary steps earlier on, I would say earlier on in the, um, the fourth year. If they're on track to, to complete whatever the graduation requirements are for the school in time to enter GME, then you would wanna leave them as match eligible. Okay, good question. If students match into urology, would this qualify them to be withdrawn from the NRMP if they registered? 
It'd be similar to withdrawing those for matching military, although they would meet graduation eligibility requirements. The answer is yes. Urology changed their program requirements. ACGME changed the program requirements for urology last year. It used to be that applicants who matched in the early match to urology would have to come into the NRMP, sponsored applicants, the senior students, would have to come into the NRMP in order to get the PGY-1 or that preliminary year of training. The program requirements for urology have changed and the urology program is now what we call an integrated training, which means they've combined that preliminary first year in with the advanced or the urological training. And so applicants who match in the urology match, which is what we call an early match because those results are known before um, the NRMP concludes its main residency match. Applicants who match that can be withdrawn and that would be a legitimate reason for a school official to be able to withdraw those applicants. Ophthalmology would be a slightly different um, example. I think there is some discussions right now for ophthalmology to become what we would call integrated, just like urology, and provide that preliminary year. Right now, ophthalmology programs don't. So if you have candidates who, who go through the San Francisco match, who match to ophthalmology, they would need to stay in there. They would need to register with the NRMP for that PGY1 or that preliminary year. So urology, yes, those candidates can be withdrawn if they are able to obtain a position. Again, ophthalmology is just an example of how for at least the time being, some of your students may have to straddle two matches. Again, I had another question about leaving applicants in without having passed boards. We know that this is, this is a real anxiety point for schools, and so I appreciate your questions. If your students are on track to graduate in time, even though they don't have their boards by the time of the raw deadline, um, or so we or so but you anticipate that they would have those boards passed They would have those scores in hand and be able to walk across the stage at commencement by all means leave them in the match If you learn after match week if you have candidates who have matched to positions and you get back board scores and they pass uh, Board scores and they have not passed then what we would ask you to do is to immediately notify the NRMP So we can begin the process of, of reaching out to the program and deciding what's going to be the best course of action It could very well be that a waiver of the match commitment would be needed. So again, if you learn after match week that something has happened, an applicant's eligibility or, or ability to, to graduate in time to start GME on July 1 is now in question, just give us a call. We'll reach out to the program and we'll begin that conversation. But if you have every expectation that they're marching along towards the requirements, you can leave them in the match. So here's a question about sponsored applicants accepting positions in the NRMP or another national match. What other matches do you consider? San Francisco match, the American Urological Association. Um, here's one, it's called SAP, which is preventive medicine. I'm not familiar with that match, but I certainly can look into it. But yes, what we are considering other national matching plans would be things like San Francisco or the American Urological Association. Specialties that have their own matching systems are, be, are ones that we would consider other plans. And again, we have the sort of the rules and criteria for that. So long as sponsored applicants are in the NRMP, or another national matching plan, everybody is, is doing fine. If a DO student takes both COMLEX and USMLE, are both scores required to be reported or just the COMLEX? Quite frankly, that's up to the student. Again, when, they, when students register for the match, they have what we call our professional profile section. We have a place for them to enter those scores. It's up to them. Um, we would like for, for students to enter at least one set of scores, but if they want to put in USMLE or COMLEX, or both, that really is their choice. And we would certainly uh, respect that and then provide that information out when it came time way later in the match season for the schools to verify that information. So it really, really would be up to them. So here's a question of an example of a student who does not qualify for the match, but does for SOAP. I will speak candidly with you because we see quite a bit when it comes to policy. Sometimes we have schools who have reported professionalism issues with a fourth year student and that fourth year student has been dismissed from school, has been dismissed from, from the, the program. If that happens before the rank order list deadline, the school official may mark that student as no longer eligible because clearly uh, the school at least looks at this candidate as not eligible for graduation and, and able to enter GME. But a lot of schools have appeals process. So it could be that if a student appeals um, that termination and the decision is overturned, 
they now are eligible and back on track to graduate. Maybe not the best example, but it is one that we have certainly seen here at the NRMP. And that could be a student who doesn't qualify uh, to have the rank order list um, included when the matching algorithm is processed, but may be back on track for an on-time graduation and could participate in SOAP. Again, would an ophthalmology student need to register for the San Francisco match and the NRMP match in the same match season? They would. They would absolutely need to register for both. Again, hopefully they would be successful in obtaining the ophthalmology position, but would need the NRMP for that first year or that PGY1 preliminary course of training. So you're, yes, there are instances where applicants will have to register and participate in two matches. If ophthalmology eventually goes the way of urology and creates what we call that integrated or combined uh, full course of training, then that would no longer need to be the case. Ah, I see somebody provided me the link for SAP, the preventive medicine match. Thank you very much. I will absolutely look into that um, and see if we need to include that information somewhere on our website. But we are closing in on five o'clock, so I think I'm going to stop it there. Um, I appreciate everybody's attendance today. I hope you found this to be helpful and, again, at least to start the conversation of new rules and requirements for your osteopathic seniors and your role as school officials. We are here, as you can see on the, on the website. If you've got questions, you can reach out to support at nrmp.org. If you have specific questions about this webinar and want to follow up with me directly, uh, my email is l c u r. T as in Tom, I-N, that's L Curtin at nrmp.org. And I would be happy to uh, correspond or communicate with you directly about this webinar. We will make sure by uh, close of business on Thursday to have the webinar up on our website. I will take all of these questions and I will write them out and provide written responses and post that as well. Um, and should other questions come up before we get started uh, in September, by all means reach out to us. But I definitely appreciate your attendance today and I look forward to working with you this next year.